um, I'm very privileged to be in this job and to um, be able to support the legacy of George and Barbara Bush to make sure that we promote it um, to as many people as we can. Um, and I think you all would probably all agree, if you're here, I think you would agree that their legacy, their ideals and values are more important than they've ever been. With all the challenges we've got at home and abroad, this is the time um, to focus on the, the life of President George Bush and the life of Mrs. Barbara Bush. So we're, we're really proud to, to have that responsibility. We're excited President Bush's 100th birthday is coming up in 2024. So y'all are gonna be hearing a lot um, about President Bush and our activities here at the Bush Presidential Center over the next couple of years. You may have seen um, Union Pacific Locomotive 4141 is in front of the library building right now. It's covered right now, which um, Warren Finch is upset about. Um, I'll introduce Warren in a second, but we're really excited. There's gonna be an expansion of the library. We're gonna have a new building that's opening for the president's birthday in June of 24. So just make sure you pay attention to all the things we've got going on. We're very excited about it. Um, one of the great things about being in this job and being at the Bush Foundation is I get to work with some amazing people every day. Um, first and foremost, our friends and colleagues at the Bush Library do an extraordinary job. The director, Warren Finch, has been here since 1993. He's been director since Christmas Day of 2004. And I think my friend Mark, who'll be out here in a second, can probably confirm that normally it's a very complicated process to become the director of a presidential library, but when it's George H.W. Bush, it just happens, and he sort of handpicked Warren and cut through all the red tape, so we're very happy to have Warren. Warren, could you wave to everybody? And then Warren's deputy, Bob Holtzwife, has also been here for a very long time. Bob's extraordinary to work with. Um, he's a historian, he's got a doctorate. Um, if you wanna know anything about the Transcontinental Railroad or a history of, of rail in this country, talk to Bob. He's probably a little nervous right now thinking about this labor strike that's about to affect all the lines going across the country. So um, if you ask him questions about it, you may not wanna go there. Um, we're also so honored and thankful to have a partnership with Texas A&M. It's an extraordinary relationship, and the living legacy of President Bush is the Bush School and all those amazing men and women um, who go through there. And it gives me hope for the future to know that the best and brightest are going to have these opportunities in public service. But we're so thankful for the A&M relationship. Chancellor Sharp, Dr. Banks are amazing people to work with, and they're so supportive of what all of us do here. Um, at the Bush Presidential Center. We have some friends from A&M with us tonight. We've got John Crawford, the Chief Financial Officer. John, where are you? You gotta wave your hand. We also have Greg Hartman is gonna be joining us. So we're, he's the Chief Operating Officer. So really appreciate all they do. Um, we, we love to work with our friends here. Um, one of our favorite groups to work with is the Association of Former Students. Um, and Gabrielle Sullivan from AFS is here today. So Gabrielle, thanks for all you do. This is a big week for them because the Distinguished Alumni Awards are gonna be given this week. So I think maybe this is just an opportunity for her to catch her breath and do something a little different before all of that happens. Um, when we're talking about important Aggies, being a Distinguished Alum here is very important. Jim Singleton is here with us tonight, who's one of our favorite Distinguished Alums. Not sure he's in the room yet. Oh, there you are, Jim, thank you. And then John White, former chair of the Board of Regents, distinguished alum, and also a member of our Board of Trustees um, here at the Bush Foundation. David Kipp, um, you, the only thing that we're missing in this event tonight is the um, having David Kipp here with the singing cadets, but we'll save that for the next event. And then finally, I wanna recognize um, Kimberly and Kathy from the Chancellor's Office. So they're so supportive of everything we do, and we're very happy to have them here as well. Um, Okay, two final um, hellos and thank yous. So Ambassador Chase Untemeyer, I know Chase is planning to be here. He may have got, there you are Chase. Chase is a very humble man, which is why he's sitting in the back. So in Bush world, Ambassador Untemeyer is a very big deal because he first started walk, working for President Bush in 1966 on his congressional campaign and stayed by his side for the rest of his life, served in the White House for Vice President Bush, served President Reagan, served in the Bush White House, and was later Ambassador to Cutter for George W. Bush. So Chase, thank you so much for making the trip.
And if y'all haven't been to the library recently, um, I recommend you go as soon as you can because we have a special exhibit there now that we're very excited about. And it's about the life of Nelson Mandela. And it's a real honor for us to have that exhibit here. And it's even greater honor to have his grandson with us tonight, Chief Mandela and his wife, Mrs. Mandela. Could y'all please stand? Okay, thank you all for, um, for your patience, but those were some thank yous that we really had to take care of. And now, um, I get to introduce the star for this evening, Mark Updegrove. Now, many of you may know Mark. Um, he is currently the president of the LBJ Foundation. He was formerly the director of the LBJ Library. He's written countless presidential biographies. And um, you've probably also seen him on TV because many of us have a face for radio, but Mark has a face for TV. Mark, can you please join us? Sorry, Mark, the, the danger in me having the microphone is I can say anything I want. <laughs> I just did. <laughs> so Mark, um, thank you for making the drive over from Austin. I know that the traffic is getting worse and worse. Um, it's a sign of improvement and growth here in College Station, but appreciate you making the trek. Um, we're really excited to have you here. We really appreciate the partnership that we have with the LBJ Foundation. I think one thing I should mention that we're really proud of here at the Bush Foundation is there's this amazing program, the Presidential Leadership Scholars, mm -hmm. which was started by President George W. Bush and President Clinton, and it involves their foundations, but also um, George H. W. Bush's foundation and the LBJ Foundation. And these are extraordinary mid-career men and women who go through this program. Um, and it makes me feel really happy that I'm in my job now because I don't think I could get it going toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of these incredible scholars. It's amazing. They're, they're, they're we, we, have, we choose 60 mid-career scholars, and these young people are exceptional in what they're doing. They're, they're, we were once doing an interview. You, you interview finalists, as Max and I will do uh, later this fall. And uh, we were once, uh, it's virtual. Uh, even before COVID, it was virtual. Uh, although the, the judges, the people who are uh, choosing the scholars are in one room. And, I was doing it with Margaret Spellings and, uh, and someone from the, the Clinton world, Margaret Spellings, who actually helped to create the program at the, at the George W. Bush Foundation. And uh, so we, it, it, we were interviewing a finalist, and then we said, well, what, do you have any questions for her? She was outstanding. She was doing these amazing things. And then we asked her, do you, do you uh, have any questions for us? And she says, yes, what gives you hope? And all three of us simultaneously said, you. <laughs> <laughs> so these young people, I say young, they're, you know, they're, 30s and 40s and early 50s are doing amazing things in this world and it gives us hope. But before we jump in, I, can I just say thank you so much, Max, for, for having me here. There, I have some good friends in the audience. Chase Untermeyer, Ambassador Untermeyer is one, and Chase, thank you so much for being here tonight. I also want to recognize my friend and colleague, Warren Finch. Uh, when I was the director of the LBJ Presidential Library, uh, Warren was more or less the dean of presidential library directors, and I learned a whole lot from Warren, and uh, just want to tip my hat to you and all you have done for the Bush Library. If I could just lead a round of applause for my friend Warren Finch, that'd be great. <laughs> and, and finally, I, I, as you know, Amy and I had the pleasure of knowing George and Barbara Bush, and it was one of the great honors of our life, and I gotta say, Max, they would be so pleased that you are leading their foundation. You're doing a phenomenal job, and I'm, I'm, pl I'm proud to be your colleague. Thank you so much, and it, it's an honor to be here. Um, but those very kind words aren't going to soften up my question. <laughs> so, again, um, thank you and Amy for being here. And because we have such a great audience here and folks, folks watching online, I thought we could just jump into it. Please. So as I said in my intro, you've written countless biographies of presidents. But there have been countless biographies written of President Kennedy, right? And even though you're a presidential biographer, with all those books out there on President Kennedy, why did you think we needed another one? What is it that inspired you to do this? You know, there's an old adage, write the book you want to read. And there are some good books on John F. Kennedy, but they're pretty voluminous. They're tomes, and they're hard to get through. And whenever I've read one in the past, I, 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 you get, they get, uh, biographers will get waylaid into specific detail, and that's really important for historians, but I wanted a brisk take on the Kennedy presidency. 
that kind of made you feel like you were there, going from crisis to crisis with John F. Kennedy during his very turbulent and very triumphant in many ways tenure in the White House. It was just two years and 10 months, but he faced crisis after crisis. And I wanted the, the reader to feel like you were there with him, getting to know this very complex uh, and in some ways great president and how he circumvented the challenges of his administration. And I also wanted to, to read like a novel because there are these really interesting people uh, and these incredibly dramatic times. So that's what I was uh, striving to achieve. And I think the other thing is we change as a society. And as a consequence, history changes. And you have to look at the great historic figures through the lens of current day. And so I, I wanted to take a kind of a look at this madman president, madman era president, uh, in a Me Too generation, you know? <laughs> We've gone through so much since he, he came into office. And I think you have to look through the, the lens of current day, and that gives you a ch different perspective on those presidents. Well, I'm sure you did weeks and months of research to prepare for this book. Um, and being at the LBJ Foundation, you had a special opportunity to look at through that lens as well. But the one thing you couldn't do um, is you couldn't interview President Kennedy. And you've interviewed seven U.S. presidents, which I think is even more than your friends, John Meacham and Michael Beschloss. Oh, I mean, good. I've got something over right, John and Michael. Right. Yeah. I don't want to, like, poke them on that. But interviewing... I might. <laughs> yeah, you should. So interviewing seven presidents, that's a big deal. But, of course, you didn't have the opportunity to interview President Kennedy because you're not old enough to have done that. What would you say to President Kennedy? How would you interview him if he was sitting here right now? What, what would you ask him? You know, that... I, the one thing I would like to know, having delved into this story, is I'd like to know more about his state of mind during the course of the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is perhaps the most dangerous hour in humankind. At a point where we were on the brink of nuclear war with the Soviet Union as a consequence of them shipping very discreetly, very furtively, uh, nuclear arms and Soviet troops into Cuba, which was 90 miles from American shores. So this is a very perilous moment. We find out that through aerial photographs that, this, that these actions are happening, uh, even though the Soviet Union has denied the existence of the troops and the weapons. And it, it becomes a pretty dangerous time when we essentially go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Russians. Kennedy uh, is resolved to, to, to face the, the crisis prudently. And uh, does not want to do anything provocative. His very jingoistic military brass is imploring him to use aerial strikes against the nuclear launch pads and, and, and weapons to take them out militarily. Kennedy's determined not to do that because that might provoke a nuclear exchange. And instead, he puts together a blockade, uh, a, a, a series of ships blocking the additional shipment of arms and troops into Cuba. He doesn't call it a blockade because that sounds provocative. He calls it a quarantine. And that gives him time to resolve the crisis. But there are these 13 harrowing days in which we don't know if there's going to be a tomorrow. Uh, Hugh Seide, who was a dear friend of, of President Bush, the reason that I know President Bush is because of our mutual friend, Hugh Seide. He was a president watcher for Time Magazine for many years and knew John F. Kennedy and told me of the time that he visited Kennedy at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis. He went to the White House and they had this, this exchange in the Oval Office and then Kennedy said, let's take a swim. And Hugh said, I didn't bring a bathing suit, Mr. President. He says, you don't need a bathing suit, Hugh. <laughs> they went skinny dipping in the pool. But when, and that, that frivolous moment is followed by Hugh leaving the White House, going through those big, big black iron gates, wondering if there was going to be a tomorrow. And so I'd love to talk to Kennedy about those moments, what he was thinking, uh, how he kept calm. I, in particular, I'd like to know what he was thinking about his counterpart, Nikita Khrushchev. You have to assume, as you're negotiating back and forth through back channels, that he is of sound mind. And he didn't know that at that point. He didn't know if he was dealing with a sound leader or if that leader had been overthrown. There was a lot of ambiguity. So I'd love to talk to him about what he was thinking in those incredibly dark moments. Well, and that also begs my next question, which is you think about here was a president who 
when we talk about George H.W. Bush, many people argue, including myself and Warren, that nobody's been more prepared to be president of the United States than George H.W. Bush based upon the jobs he had had um, in and out of government. So he was extraordinarily well prepared to be president. Um, Senator Kennedy had not served for very long, and he was younger, and maybe he didn't have as much of experience as he would have liked going into the presidency, and maybe there was a, a leadership um, growth element that needed to happen there. Maybe there was a curve, right? And, and you talk about that in the book, mm. and, and you talk about how Bay of Pigs was a disastrous moment for him. That was, that was a low point. He had a bad summit with Khrushchev that probably couldn't have gone much worse than it did. And then he has this amazing leadership moment during the Cuban Missile Crisis. That one really speaks to me, and that's the one that we all know. But what are other examples that you might give us today, um, for those of us who've read the book and those who will read the book after tonight, of that leadership growth? Because it was two years, a little more than two years, but it seems like he grew a lot as a president. He did, and, and uh, actually, and to uh, reinforce the point you're making, Kennedy enters the Senate in 19, or the House, excuse me, at the age of 29 in 1946, relatively young. He doesn't do much in the House because he has his eyes on the Senate. He gains a Senate seat in 1952 and doesn't do much in the Senate because he has his eyes on the vice presidency. Tries to get the nomination of his party to the vice presidency in 1956, doesn't get it, and then aims for the presidency. So he's just waiting to get the top job. That's where he really wants to be. He doesn't get much out it, it, relatively infertile tenures in both the House and, and Senate. But there's a, and he doesn't do a, a particularly good job, despite a, the, the soaring rhetoric of his inauguration, where he rallies all Americans. Bear in mind that Kennedy only wins the presidency by 118,000 votes. Two tenths of a percentage point uh, in, the, in the popular vote make the difference between a President Nixon in 1961 versus a President Kennedy. It was a very narrow victory, the most narrow of the 20th century. Uh, but by the time he gives his wonderful inauguration speech on January 20th, 1961, the, the, the American people are all in. So much so that when he stumbles in the Bay of Pigs quagmire, which you just mentioned, Max, in April of 1961, just three months after he takes the presidency, his approval rating is an astounding 83%. Only 5% of Americans disapprove of the performance of John F. Kennedy. That's, that's an amazing, think about that. With a, a squeaker election like that, to rally behind your president to that degree. But it gives him a black eye. And, and then he has that disaster summit with Khrushchev, as you mentioned, in June. The Bay of Pigs quagmire in particular uh, is a learning lesson from, from Kennedy. There's, there's an old joke about a great business magnate. Uh, and he is called upon by a young striver who wants to achieve the same kind of success. And she asks him, what does it take to succeed? And he says, good judgment. And she says, okay. She, she asks, how do you get good judgment? He says, experience. She thinks about that. She says, okay, how do you get experience, she asks. He says, bad judgment. <laughs> <laughs> Kennedy shows some very bad judgment in his first months in the presidency, but he learns from it. So the Cuban Missile Crisis, after this failed incursion of Cuba in which we uh, ignominiously tried to topple the administration of Fidel Castro, uh, uh, Kennedy learns not to, to take the advice of his, uh, his, his very jingoistic, very bellicose military reflexively. He learns to keep his aides very, very close. And he learns to give himself a little bit more time, again, which makes all the difference in the, in the, uh, the, the peaceful resolution of the Cuban Missile Crisis. He's also humble. You know, in, in talking to George Herbert Walker Bush and George W. Bush, both of them would say, told me when I interviewed them, that the most important quality you can have as a leader is humility. And Kennedy, after the the, the Bay of Pigs fiasco, to his credit, takes, the, takes the, the brunt of the criticism. He says, success has many fathers, but failure is an orphan. But at the end of the day, the fault for this failed mission falls to me, and I will strive to do better. He tells the American people, I resolve to do better. And I think that had a lot to do with the 83% approval that he got. We knew how important it was for John F. Kennedy to, to succeed at the height 
of the Cold War, and we were going to support our callow and uh, uh, chastened president. So you're probably one of the most qualified people to answer the next question um, based on your current job, but here in Texas, you know, LBJ is still larger than life, even decades after he passed away, and he left quite a, quite a footprint here in Texas and across the country. And we think about JFK and LBJ, and they have extraordinarily different backgrounds, different personalities, maybe different worldviews. Um, they were political rivals. They weren't especially close. And when President Kennedy picked LBJ to be his vice president, some people didn't think that LBJ would say yes. And many people in Kennedy's camp, as you know better than me, didn't want him to make that ask. So I think having you here and thinking about how you've studied both presidents for many years, can you talk about that complicated relationship? Because they seemed like the odd couple, and in many ways they were, but both of them accomplished extraordinary things. How, how does that relationship work? It, was it as complicated and complex as we think? Yes. Um, the, <laughs> you know, so, so um, when John F. Kennedy garnered the nomination of the Democratic Party for the presidency, again, he was a relative, he, he didn't achieve much in the Senate. He was well known for a variety of reasons, partly because of the Kennedy family. His father was one of the wealthiest Americans at that time. And so the Kennedy family had a certain mystique, and that was part of it. But, but again, he didn't achieve much. Lyndon Johnson, on the other hand, uh, uh, who also entered the House chamber at the age of, of 29 and would have his eyes on the Senate, uh, quickly ascended through the ranks of the Senate. He was minority whip, m uh, minority leader, and majority leader within the course of uh, eight years. It's a remarkable ascent. And just after he entered the Senate, he was quickly elevated to minority whip. And he becomes probably the most powerful majority leader in the history of our country, certainly of the 20th century, and the youngest. He was just 46 when he, when he achieved that position. Uh, so so he, he was a force, a powerful force. John F. Kennedy, when it was expected, he would throw his hat in the ring for the presidency, talk to the National Press Club, and he started with a joke. Uh, it w he said, I was sitting with Esty Kefauver, also a very auspicious senator and a potential presidential candidate for the Democratic Party. He said, I was sitting with Esty Kefauver and Lyndon Johnson uh, the other day. And I said to the group, hey, hey guys, listen, I know we're all aspiring for the presidency. But listen, you can just forget about it. Because last night, I was visited by the Lord Almighty. And, and he said to me, I will anoint you the next president. So, fellas... Appreciate your ambitions, but it's wrapped up. Esti Kefauver says, hey, wait a minute, Jack, not so fast. Because last night I was visited by God, and God told me he would anoint me president. And Lyndon Johnson says, hey, fellas, hold on. I didn't visit anyone last night. <laughs> <laughs> and there was an element of truth to this. In under the Capitol Dome, at least, Lyndon Johnson was like God himself because he was so powerful. He was such a master uh, of, of the legislative process. The Kennedys know this. And so when Jack Kennedy gets the nomination, he's thinking about the right running mates. And of course you're going to offer it to Lyndon Johnson, partly because of the regional balance. Increasingly, the Dixiecrats in the South were suspicious of Northern liberals, and was, Jack Kennedy was more or less the embodiment of Northern liberalism. So he needed regional balance on the ticket. But the other thing is, and it goes back to the point you made about George Herbert Walker Bush, the reason that Reagan chose him, perhaps almost as reflexively, is because he was so qualified. If something were to befall him, he had somebody who could easily fill the duties of President of the United States. No mean feat. George H.W. Bush was the right person, uh, and so was Lyndon Johnson for those reasons. He was eminently qualified, understood Washington, understood power, understood the presidency. When you're thinking about that transition from President Kennedy to President Johnson, um, can you put that a little bit in the context of the civil rights movement and what was happening there um, and what President Johnson was able to accomplish um, sort of on the heels of, of President Kennedy? You know, we have the great good fortune in America so often um, of, of good timing. And 
uh, Bush 41 is a perfect example of that. If anyone is going to succeed Ronald Reagan when there is the collapse of the Soviet Union, man, who better to be in the presidency than George Herbert Walker Bush? It's amazing how lucky we were to have him in place. He's the right person, given his background and temperament and skills, to, to manage that crisis, which he did with, with uh, great excellence. And I think we, get, we were lucky that when an assassin's bullet befell Jack Kennedy in his prime, he was followed by Lyndon Johnson. What we get with Jack Kennedy is this, this leader who gets us believing in ourselves. Clement Attlee, who was the, uh, the prime minister who succeeded Winston Churchill, once said of Churchill's rhetorical ability in World War II, uh, words at great moments can be deeds. And while Kennedy hasn't accomplished much in terms of deeds in his presidency, those words that he gave in a series of speeches, including his inaugural address, inspire us. And we start believing in ourselves and in our government. So by the time that Jack Kennedy leaves the presidency uh, by his assassination, our faith in government stands at an all-time high of 77%, the highest it's ever been. To, to put that in perspective, it's now 20%. And the Cold War tensions have simmered as a consequence of the peaceful resolution of the Cuban Missile Crisis, which allows Kennedy to stand on the world unparalleled. So the Cold War, which was the major issue when Kennedy becomes president, simmers down a bit, and we can concentrate on the domestic issues at hand. Kennedy didn't give a great deal of attention to civil rights, but it's of great interest to Lyndon Johnson, who is this master legislator who can, who can push, push laws through that Jack Kennedy couldn't even dream of. And so when Johnson takes the presidency upon Kennedy's assassination, uh, he's talking to aides about what he wants to accomplish now that he has the power of the presidency. And they advise him not to push the Civil Rights Act of 1963, which would become the Civil Rights Act of 1964, into law because he risks losing the party in the South to the Republicans, and he risks losing the presidency in his own right in the election in 1964. And Johnson looks at him and says, what the hell's the presidency for? He puts it all on the line to push the Civil Rights Act that Jack Kennedy proposed but didn't put much weight behind into law using the martyrdom of Jack Kennedy. So I think without LBJ, I don't think you get the fruition as, of civil rights as quickly as you do. Great. Thank you. So you were talking earlier about President Kennedy's popularity after the election, even though it was such a close election and that amazingly high approval rating. And I think all these years later, um, there's a fascination with President Kennedy, with, with his wife, with the family. You know, that, that was the time of Camelot. He was representing a younger generation and all of this change. You know, you think now about how everybody's in the spotlight. We have sort of these celebrity politicians. They, they might have been the first who were, who were treated that way, and they were, and they were beloved in many ways. And that fascination has remained. I promised I won't ask any questions about the grassy knoll. <laughs> I will not do that today. But I do think that people continue to think about President Kennedy, continue to think about his life, his administration, what if. Why have we had that sustained popularity all these years later? Why do we still talk about him so much now, even though you know, he passed away in 1963 after a short tenure as president. You know, I think it's, it's threefold, uh, Max. One is those speeches and that Kennedy image. America was captivated uh, by him and his very beguiling wife, Jackie Kennedy, while uh, they were in the, the Oval Office. I, they just cast such a glamorous glow, essentially. I, I mentioned Hugh Seide before, and I remember Hugh telling me that even though you, know, you can be pretty jaded in Washington, particularly as a reporter, but he would say that when they went abroad, he couldn't help but to be so proud that these people were re representing his country. Uh, again, because they did have this, this, just, um, this glamour about them, this elegance, eloquence certainly as well. And that's the second part of this. Those speeches that uh, JFK gave continue to inspire just as, as they were inspiring when he gave them, we watch clips of them 
uh, even now, and they are inspiring. They get us reaching beyond ourselves, asking not what our country can do for us, but what we can do for our country. I think the other thing is, is the power of the Camelot myth. Because Kennedy uh, was struck down at the young age of 46, we remember the best in him, because he was martyred, more or less. And I think the Kennedys were quick to start um, sowing the seeds of the Camelot myth. Partly because Bobby Kennedy had a, a, a aspirations to be president. After his, he was the, sort of the, the heir to the Kennedy throne, if you will, and all eyes were on him to take the mantle of the presidency himself. And so building up the myth of Jack Kennedy, building up the legend of Jack Kennedy was beneficial to, to, to Bobby Kennedy. And I think finally, um, there is something about the, the times of the 1960s that are alluring. And while there, was, there were certainly tempests that would come later on in the decade after he had passed away, we, we think about those what ifs. And because JFK has become sort of the personification of greatness, we think in our heads that he could have done it better than, than Lyndon Johnson or Richard Nixon, and that we wouldn't have had a Vietnam. We would have had civil rights quicker. We wouldn't have had the, the civil unrest that we have. And that's pure speculation. I think there's no evidence of that whatsoever. But still, it's, it's alluring to think, what if he had lived this great, he, would, he had such great promise and potential. What if he had continued to lead us as a nation? And do you think that that pressure stayed with his family moving forward? I mean, obviously RFK, was, was struck down at a young age. And then you have Senator Ted Kennedy, who turned out to be you know, a lion of the US Senate and built a great relationship with President George H.W. Bush. President Bush gave him the George H.W. Bush Leadership Award um, a number of years ago. How do you think um, that sort of Camelot myth affected someone like Ted Kennedy during his career? I think Bobby Kennedy felt huge pressure to, 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 to achieve the presidency himself, and he was on a good track in 1968 when he himself in his early 40s was, uh, was struck down by an assassin's bullet. Ted Kennedy, I, I, I had the pleasure to, to meet him on a couple of occasions, and he referred to his brother as President Kennedy, never, to, never as Jack or anything else. It was always President Kennedy, and he, I think he held his brothers in such high esteem and never felt like he would achieve what they had achieved. In fact, if you look at his Senate tenure, he achieved remarkable things. I think he was more of a natural senator than his brothers were when they were in the upper chainer. He was more garrulous, he was more amiable, uh, he was more collegial, and really loved the legislative process in the same manner that, that LBJ did. I think he felt the pressure of achieving the presidency for his family because of his heritage. Obviously, he wasn't able to do so, but again, it, it would always amaze me that he never felt he was worthy of being in his, his, his brother's footsteps, and yet in some ways accomplished more than they did. Thank you. So my staff recommended this morning that I reread your book, um, and I probably should have done that to prepare for the conversation this evening, but instead, I was watching the coverage of Queen Elizabeth um, going to Westminster and all the pomp and circumstance around that, as I'm sure many of us were in this room, especially Stephanie. Um, and, yes, and to me, it's, it's a very remarkable moment in history because she's one of the last of that greatest generation who served in World War II. Um, and it sort of begins to close a chapter on, on modern history in the Western world, right? And you're very qualified to, to answer this question, having written a book about President Bush, 41 and 43. But you think about President John F. Kennedy, you think about President George H.W. Bush, they were different, mm. and they had different presidencies and different careers, but they're of the same generation. Um, they were from the Northeast, they went to Ivy League schools, and they both served in World War II in the Pacific Theater at very young ages, um, were highly decorated and had near-death experiences. And we think a lot here at the Bush Presidential Center about how that shaped President Bush's life and what it did for him in terms of focusing like a laser on serving others and that selfless service mantra that we share with our friends here in Aggieland. How did that impact President Kennedy 
coming out of that Pacific theater and having an experience similar to President Bush? And how did that possibly impact him in public life and maybe when he served as president later? You know, it's, it's, I was thinking about this as well, Max. First of all, but the, both JFK and Bush 41 are similar in the sense that they, had, they were hugely ambitious. And they went through life at breakneck speed, taking nothing for granted. And I think it's partly because of that war experience. They saw the fragility of life. For, for Bush 41, he was a relatively protected young man when he went into the, the, the service uh, at, the, uh, at the age of 18, uh, 17 when he enlisted. Uh, and he saw how devastating war was. And then he would come out of war to lose his daughter, Robin. So he was, he was terribly aware of the fragility of life and, and perhaps his own mortality. The same is true for, for Jack Kennedy, although before Jack Kennedy went into the war, he was aware of his own mortality because he was a sickly kid. He had near-death experiences several times before entering the war. And then, of course, when he went into the war, his, his ship was struck down. He lost two crewmates. His brother died in the war. His sister died shortly after the war. His sister, Rosemary, who had, was mentally challenged, was one of the early lobotomy cases mm -hmm. and really was never the same after being lobotomized. So Kennedy constantly saw that life could be gone in an instant. There's this really telling chapter uh, um, in, in which I've, I've, I've sort of explored that part of Kennedy. And um, again, this, his awareness of mortality. He has just lost his child, Patrick, in August of 1963. And a month later, he's on a sailboat. He was always most at peace when he was on the, the water, maybe like George uh, Herbert Walker. Actually, George Herbert Walker Bush was never at peace on the water because you were going 120 miles an hour. <laughs> but there was a listless day on the Nantucket Sound, and Kennedy is on a sailboat with friends. And as the, 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 the boat just kind of drifts, he says to no one in particular, how do you think Lyndon would be if I were to be killed? How would Lyndon Johnson be in the presidency if I were to die? Now he's. 46 years of age, he's in perfect health at the time. I mean, although he was taking a regimen of drugs that might kill somebody if they weren't strong, but it was amazing how many drugs he was taking for Addison's disease and, and, and back problems. But again, relatively healthy at the time, and he's thinking about his own mortality. I think that, that um, it says a lot about Kennedy. He wanted to achieve things because he didn't take life for granted, and he didn't know how long it was going to last. So since I have the proverbial um, stage up here <laughs> um, and the gavel. So I can go any direction now, but one thing I'd like to um, take advantage of since we have you here and since we're in College Station at the Bush Presidential Center, to talk a little bit about the Bush family that, that you know well. Um, as you mentioned earlier, um, you got to know President George H.W. Bush and First Lady Barbara Bush very well um, during your time here serving in Texas at the LBJ Library and Foundation. And then you also got to know President George W. Bush well because you wrote a book about both President Bushes. We are all honored and privileged to you know, work for the Bush family, to, to be able to carry their legacy forward as best we can. But can you talk about your reflections on President and Mrs. Bush um, and then also on that relationship between the two President Bushes because you have a very unique perspective having studied um, U.S. presidents for, for your career, but also having to spend so much time with the Bushes. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a Democrat. Um, I will... <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> Amy and I might be the only Democrats in this room. Uh, but I will tell you that I voted for both Bushes. And um, part of the reason is because at a distance, before I got to know them, I saw their decency. I respected their values. Uh, and as I came to know them, I, I, I respected them even more. They're, they're remarkable people. Can I tell a couple of quick stories? Please. Um, I, 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 Amy and I spent, my, my wife Amy Updegrove, the, the longtime publisher of Texas Monthly, and I were, as, as I mentioned, privileged to know them earlier. 
as just as, as your privilege to serve them. Uh, but two stories. One was uh, we were at Kennebunkport um, where I was doing a series of interviews with, with President and Mrs. Bush for the book. And we invited the Bushes over to our very small home for, for drinks and dinner. And, and they came over. And um, the next day, I was speaking at a fundraiser for the Kennebunkport Public Library. And as I walked uh, Mrs. Bush to her Secret Service SUV, she said, you know, George and I are coming to your speech tomorrow. I said, you know, I, yeah, I know, I'm honored. She said, what are you going to be talking about? I said, uh, well, I'll talk about the presidency for about 40 minutes and take about 10 minutes worth of questions. And she looked at me and she said, make it 10 minutes, or sorry, make it 30 minutes, no questions. <laughs> <laughs> and so I spoke for 29 minutes <laughs> because you didn't take any chances with Barbara Bush. Uh, and whenever I speak, you know, I think to myself, you, you, you might be going too long. Barbara, somewhere Barbara Bush is watching. The other story is about President Bush and how thoughtful he was. Before I really got to know him, I came down to interview him for a book I did called Second Acts, which is about presidential lives and legacies after the White House, about the post-presidential years. And um, I brought, my son was very young at the time, and, my, and George H.W. Bush was in the White House. And my son, I think he was four years old at the time, drew a picture of Presidents Bush 41 and Bush 43 in the White House. And it was a very crude drawing by a four-year-old kid. And just as a gesture of thanks, I said to President Bush, my son, Charlie, wanted you to have this. And just we both want to thank you for your service to the nation and for the service that your son is rendering right now. And he looked at it and he said, do you want me to sign it? And I said, oh, I, my guy, well, that'd be fantastic. And so he goes back to his desk. I was sitting there with Gene Becker, his longtime chief of staff and a dear friend, who would later become a dear friend. And we're sitting there waiting for him to finish. And we hear all these drawers being rattled. I said, what is going on back there? Man, that's wild. One drawer would rattle, and then another drawer would rattle. And I thought, wow, what's going on? And he came back with a picture. And it said, dear Charlie, this is a wonderful picture. Sincerely, uh, George H.W. Bush, old Bush 41. And every single word was in a different color magic marker. <laughs> Please tell me you still have this. Somewhere. I still have it. Okay. It's framed for my son, Charlie. But I thought, what a wonderfully thoughtful gesture. On, and it must have taken him five or 10 minutes to find all these pets. And he made sure that everyone was a different color. And of course, a four-year-old is going to love that. It's going to be delightful for, you, for a four-year-old. It just shows how absolutely thoughtful he was. And it won't surprise you that he famously kept coloring books and crayons in his desk for the children of the Secret Service agents. So in that same vein, President Bush was always thinking about others. It makes perfect sense. But you know, uh, they, you asked about the relationship that they, they had. And it's funny, I, I was asked recently uh, in an interview I did, about the relationship between Barack Obama and Joe Biden, neither of whom I, I know. I've, I've interviewed both of them, but I, I certainly don't know them well. But I speculated, and they said, what, what kind of advice is Barack Obama giving to Joe Biden? And I think I know because of what I heard from the Bushes about their exchanges when Bush 43 was in the White House. And that is, they're probably just talking about the small things in the job. How you doing? Are you taking care of yourself? You know, the, the little parts of the job. And because Obama knows, just as Bush 41 did, that the, the incumbent president doesn't need somebody else telling him what to do. Even if he did the job before him, he just needs to know that there's somebody who understands the burden that he's shepherding right now. And that he has somebody he can talk to if he needs to. I guarantee that's what it was. And so there was all this inside the beltway. Well, actually, throughout America, we were speculating. What are they talking about? Oh, the old Bush 41 must be schooling his son right now on, on this or that. That's utterly, if you knew George Herbert Walker Bush, you would know that is absolutely preposterous, partly because of the humility I just talked about. He was humble enough to know that times had changed in the eight years that he had left office, and he had confidence in his son that he would find the right road. He just wanted his son to know that his father loved him no matter what, and that he was there for him no matter what. And that, that came very clear. Well, that's, that's extraordinary. So George H.W. Bush is famous for his humility, as was Mrs. Bush and the Bush family. Um, 
before I read your book and before we had this conversation today, I wouldn't have thought, frankly, of President Kennedy as humble, but you explained very well that after that setback, he learned from it, right? We all make mistakes, and his mistakes were much more significant because he was President of the United States. Um, but, but he learned from those mistakes, and he, he gained some humility. That was a big surprise to me from reading the book, not something I was expecting to, to get. You've studied President Kennedy for decades. You've probably been thinking about writing this book for just as long, but you had to write the other books first and you couldn't get to it. What was something that surprised you about President Kennedy? Um, what was something that, that you took away from the research process and then when you had your very talented wife, Amy, reading the galleys, you say to her, I wasn't expecting to, to find this out about President Kennedy or here's a new perspective I gained. What, what surprised you in writing the book? You know, I think you try to figure out what makes, when, when you're doing a biography, what makes your subject tick? What explains him? And again, I think what explained Kennedy for me was, was again, understanding mortality, seeing how fragile life is. He wanted to make his mark on the world. There's a, when, um, when Abraham Lincoln was in school, I, I think he was in junior, well, I was, he was but, but with the equivalent of sixth grade. He wrote a poem, um, Abe Lincoln, pen in hand. Wait, let me think about this. Abe Lincoln, pen in hand. Uh, oh, Abe Lincoln, pen in hand. He will achieve something, but God knows when. <laughs> Even at that young age, he wanted to achieve something. And uh, Abe Lincoln suffered from great depression throughout the course of his life and contemplated suicide on at least two occasions. But the reason that he didn't end his own life is because he hadn't made his mark on the world, truly. And then his moment comes in, you know, in 1861 when he becomes president and guides us through the Civil War. He makes his mark on the world. And I think John Kennedy and to a great extent George H.W. Bush wanted to make their marks on the world. But in Kennedy's case, he knew time was short, just as I believe uh, Abraham Lincoln did. So Mark, this has been extraordinary, and we're so fortunate to have you here today. Um, before we say our thank yous, just a reminder that there will be a book signing um, outside here right after the event, um, and so please get a chance to have your book signed, talk with Mark. He's gonna stay around for a little bit. I know he'd like to interact with y'all. And a huge thank you to all of you for being here. We have a huge crowd, particularly for a Wednesday during early September when the traffic is horrendous <laughs> here in College Station. So. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for making it on time. Thank you very much. Thank you. What a delight. Thank you. And then, again, a thank you to all of you for all you do to support what we're doing, but a big thank you to Mark. Mark, thank you for being with us here today. This was Delighted extraordinary. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. What a great conversation, buddy. Thank you. Thank you.